Therefore, it is now time for question period. The, the member from Nipissing. <clears throat> Thank you and uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. The announcement of a, final, a financial literacy pilot program is an important first step. But in a Toronto Star article, financial literacy expert Tricia Berry argues that the mandated financial literacy needs to be introduced much earlier. In fact, she suggests by grade six. She says, quote, elementary students should not be left behind. But this government speaker is doing exactly that by saddling them with thousands of dollars of debt because of their overspending. In fact, it's nearly $23,000 a student. Mr. Speaker, how long is the Minister of Education going to keep elementary students in the dark about her government's fiscal mismanagement? Question. Thank you, Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for uh, this question. I'm, I'm very pleased to rise in the House uh, today and to talk about how we're investing in our students in Ontario in 21st century learning. And, uh, and of course, that includes uh, financial literacy. I committed to, in November, to um, make financial literacy a mandatory part of the grade 10 curriculum. And that is exactly what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. Um, in addition, Mr. Speaker, we have, uh, since 2011, in fact, made uh, financial literacy a part of our elementary school curriculum, starting in grade four, uh, right through to secondary school to grade 12, Mr. Speaker, so that as uh, students uh, move through the grades, that they're acquiring this really good this. knowledge. And we're taking this Answer. a step further by making it a mandatory part of the grade 10 curriculum, Mr. Speaker. We're ensuring that our students have what they need. Thank you. Supplementary. The uh, Minister, Kamiya Kamari, who teaches uh, careers at Thornhill Secondary School, had this to say, quote, both money skills and digital literacy are critical tools for high school kids and are subjects they're eager to learn about. Speaker, we just wish the Liberal Caucus members were as eager to learn about money skills. My question to the Minister is, if she had introduced this earlier, Minister would Ontario Children and Services. still be the most indebted subnational government on the planet? Thank you. You know, Mr. Speaker, um, Mr. The the member opposite himself has said that he's happy with the new approach. He said that to me, actually, personally. He's happy with the new approach we're taking to, uh, to financial literacy. So I know, I know that he supports this, uh, this direction and this investment, Mr. Speaker. Um, I do want to let the, the House know, because we're very excited about the work that we're doing in uh, 21st century learning in Ontario and the investments that we're making in our schools, in our teachers, in our students, Mr. Speaker. Um, just this morning, I was at uh, St. Mary's Academy, Mr. Speaker, with the member from Davenport to talk about schisms, Mr. Speaker, those specialist high skills major programs that are really world-leading programs, teaching skills, real-world knowledge that they will need to build on, and uh, we're going to continue to invest in that, including information and communications technology, Mr. Speaker, and of course, digital learning is a really important aspect Answer. of our curriculum in Ontario. And we we will continue to lead, Mr. Wow. Speaker. Thank you. Yeah. Final supplementary. Back to the minister. Well, we all know what happens when you don't have financial literacy. You get 13 consecutive Liberal budgets that throw hardworking Ontario families into debt. You get 13 consecutive Liberal budgets that make life harder for families and seniors. You get 13 consecutive Liberal budgets that mean people work harder, pay more, and get less. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister of Education be requiring her caucus colleagues to participate in the financial literacy pilot project? So, so Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm delighted that the member opposite is aware of our pilot project, Mr. Right. Speaker. 29 pilots that will be happening across yeah, yeah. the province, Mr. Speaker, involving our educators as researchers, involving our students and the input, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we've heard from students in Ontario that they want financial literacy. Uh, we've been working together to ensure that this is part of our curriculum, a part of the mandatory course in grade 10, and, uh, and we're really thrilled with the direction that we're taking, ensuring that students have the real-world knowledge that they need to succeed, and we're giving them Answer. the tools that, that they need, Mr. Speaker, in 21st century learning. So I thank, thank the you. member for this thank question.
Member from Nipissing. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. When the Premier stumped for the Prime Minister during the election, she promised that it would reap benefits for Ontario. But it looks like the Premier traded her favours for nothing more than a campaign stop during the Whitby Oshawa by election. Yesterday, the Minister of Finance looked disparaged, deflated, and defeated when addressing the federal budget. Mr. Speaker, what else did the minister ask for that he didn't receive? Does the finance minister need to rewrite the Ontario budget because the prime minister didn't give him what he wanted? Thank you. Minister, minister finance. Mr. Speaker, uh, yesterday the federal government came out with their second budget reflecting on the deficiencies of the previous government that did nothing for Ontario, provided no investments to grow our economy, leaving us empty as we move forward in stimulated growth. We invested heavily. We've taken the steps to come to balance this year, Mr. Speaker, recognizing the measures that we've done to grow the economy, something that that party across the way has always, always declined. Oh. They would rather we cut across the board 100,000 jobs in one year, no less, Mr. Speaker, and without any care for those that matter most. We have taken the, the, the right steps to invest in the economy, control our spending, coming to balance, and ensuring, Mr. Speaker, that we have a sustained future for all Ontarians going forward. Supplementary. Uh, back to the minister. Well, the finance minister is trying to hold his cards close to his chest, Speaker, but sadly he does not have a very good poker face. Yesterday he looked visibly upset. He got nothing he asked for. He didn't get the capital gains tax on housing purchases. He didn't get the health transfer he hoped for. We can only imagine that the release of the federal budget left his entire office scrambling. So, Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Finance tell us when he's releasing his Ontario budget, or is he now waiting for the rewrite? Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, the federal government has aligned with the Ontario government in regards to skills and training, in regards to investing in childcare, and ensuring that we work through the labour market agreements that enables some of our most precarious workers now to have some support, which it didn't have under the Harris government and under the Harper government in the past, Mr. Speaker. So, as we consolidate these initiatives, we're going to be able to support some more skills and training. These are important initiatives, and when it comes to infrastructure spending, the federal government has again reaffirmed their desire to do so without incrementality to the province. That too is critically important, Mr. Speaker. So while the member opposite sits on his hands and makes up numbers, we here are dealing with what's real, and that is the people of Ontario and their needs yes, and ensuring that we deliver for them. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, back to the minister. When the finance minister planned for the upcoming budget, he certainly hadn't planned for a multi-billion dollar hydro scheme. At that time, this government didn't even think Ontario's hydro crisis was a problem. So that's billions upon billions Chief in government will. Now his government has failed to successful lobby in Ottawa. They're missing out on billions in opportunities for Ontario. Mr. Speaker, is the Minister of Finance now scrambling to put together their budget? And when will Ontarians see this new budget? Thank you. Mr. Finance. So I appreciate the fact that the member opposite has recognized that we are reducing rates. 25 percent across the board because of the, the measures that we've taken to afford to do those measures, Mr. Speaker. And because we've taken the steps necessary to afford them and still come to balance, we're providing for the people of Ontario to help their everyday lives. And as we proceed throughout that process, regardless of what the federal government has done, we've taken into consideration all of those factors. And that enables us, Mr. Speaker, and I want to reaffirm that we are balancing the books. And we've taken the steps to do so without putting in harm's way health care, or education, or social programs, or child care, or affordable housing, and jobs, Mr. Speaker. 700,000 net new jobs have come to this Answer. province since we've taken office in regards to that uh, recession, and we're succeeding and surpassing. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Nippleville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thanks, Premier. The Premier has promised to reduce the burden of soaring hydro bills at Ontario Hospital by 2 per cent. Let me be clear, that's not good enough. Health Sciences North in Sudbury, where I live, invested heavily in energy conservation and saw their hydro bill go up by 26 per cent. 
Peterborough Regional Hospital cut their hydro consumption by 25 per cent and saw their bill go up by 8 per cent. Does the acting premier think that our hospital in Sudbury would have been better off with just a 24 per cent increase, or does she think that the people in Peterborough would be comforted by a 6 per cent increase rather than an 8 per cent increase? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Health and Minister of Health, long-term care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm, I'm actually elated that the uh, member opposite has referenced uh, Health Sciences North. <laughs> well, the member opposite wants to see me even more excited. I think if they just wait a minute, they're going to see that because Health Sciences North has spent the last two and a half years taking advantage of a number of Government of Ontario programs uh -huh. that help them specifically with their energy costs. Right. They've received a quarter of a million dollars in incentives to help with efficiency updates, and the result of those upgrades that they've made. Member from Speaker, Kitchener Waterloo. The result of those upgrades is that they now save more than five. Hundred thousand dollars per year on their energy costs, wow. and I am getting excited and I am elated with this because when you combine that, Mr. Speaker, Answer. with the increase in the funding we provided, and I'm happy to talk about that in the supplementary. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, St. Joseph Healthcare in Hamilton saw a 105 percent increase in their hydro bill. Under the Liberal plan, they will get a two percent decrease. Wow. Is the minister okay with a 103% increase in hydro bill? So, so, Mr. Speaker, we need to remind Ontarians that the electricity costs of hospitals on average are approximately 1%. We increased the entire operating budget of Health Sciences North last year by 3.2%, or almost $9 million. We increased the operating budget, the entire budget, not the 1% that the member opposite is talking about, which is electricity. The entire budget of St. Joe's and Hamilton increased by 3.8%. Over $15 million, Mr. Speaker. And, in, and Mr. Speaker, in Peterborough, again, as what happened in Sault Ste. Marie, the CEO of the hospital had to come out and had to actually refute the claims made by the NDP, saying that hydro costs represent less than 1% of their budget and that Peterborough Hospital has dramatically decreased energy consumption through various energy saving programs and measures across the hospital. They've reduced their consumption by 25%. Mr. Fantastic. Speaker, and they have yes, indicated sir. that they are working well and working closely with the government on further measures. Mr. Thank you. Final supplementary. What about the hospital in Niagara? A 96 per cent increase. The hospital in Windsor, a 49 per cent increase. Toronto East General, a 67 per cent increase on their hydro bill. How can the minister tout the virtue of his government $40 billion borrowing scheme that does not address the really real concern that have been to express to him repeatedly and publicly by hospitals. Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, with the Niagara Health System, we increased their budget, the entire budget, not the one percent of the budget that is applied to electricity, but the entire $381 million operating budget of Niagara Health Systems, we increased that budget by a further 2.5 per cent, or $9.4 million. And again, the hospital in Niagara, as a result of the misinformation that the NDP has been spreading— The member, the, the member will withdraw. I withdraw, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. So, in response to the confusion being spread by the uh, NDP, the, uh, the, uh, pardon me, the Executive Vice President of Finance and Operations of Niagara Falls says that our teams have been able to absorb any increase in cost by continuously looking for efficiency Answer. in our operation. Even a member of Niagara agreed that the increases, much of that was a result of the Thank doubling you. in size of the new St. Catherine. Hospital, Mr. Thank you. New question, the member from Merci, Mr. My next question is also to the acting premier. Right here, right now in Ontario, private clinics are charging people thousands of dollars to jump the queue. They are forcing our families and our seniors to wait longer for their care. For-profit companies are charging up to $100 
just to see a doctor. They're charging money to get people a diagnosis. They are charging money for a physician to sign a prescription. Why does the acting premier think Order. that it is okay to make people pay up or wait longer for the health care that they need? Thank you, Deputy Premier. Mr. Health, Health, Health Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think it's important to reassure Ontarians and indeed this legislature that what the, what the member opposite is talking about, I believe what she's talking about, is digital or internet interactions that are taking place. No one in this province is allowed to, permitted to, under the law, to actually provide financial or receive incentives to, to, to receive uh, OHIP publicly insured uh, health care services and programs, Mr. Speaker. So, so that simply isn't the case, that individuals in this province have that legal right because of Medicare, because of our universal health care system, because of the legislation that we put in place in 2004, which makes it illegal for those kinds of activities to take place. If it takes place in a digital interaction online, Mr. Speaker, Answer. that is not currently a uh, except with certain pilot programs that we have, it is not currently an OHIP funded Thank procedure. Thank you. Commentary. I think we can all agree, Speaker, that you should never need a credit card to see a doctor here in Ontario. But right here, right now, under this Liberal government, private clinics are charging thousands of dollars to jump the queue. And companies like Maple and Akira are charging up to $100 to see a physician. How can this minister allow private clinics to charge money for basic health care services and force everybody else to wait longer for the care that they need? Wow. Thank you, Minister. You know, Mr. Speaker, this. We have to be so careful here. And the member know, from Kitchener-Waterloo, I mean, second time. And Mr. 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 Speaker, I don't want to be in a position where I have to withdraw or apologize again. But the kind of confusion that this member is sowing across this province right now, it simply is not the case that individuals in Ontario have to pay to see OHIP insured health to receive OHIP insured health services. They do not pay to jump the queue. It's illegal. We're monitoring this so closely. The examples that the member opposite is providing, erroneous examples, I would argue, Mr. Speaker, that, that, that suggest somehow that people are able to buy their way to the front of the line or somehow that people have to pay for prescriptions from a physician, it's simply not true. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I know the minister doesn't get it, but some things are not for sale. And that includes the health care that our families need and count on. Charging people thousands of dollars a year. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport, come to order. Minister of Agriculture, come to order. And there's a. Carry on, please. I can't even. Charging people thousands of dollars a year for health care is wrong. Charging people Up the clock. <laughs> Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation come to order. Minister of Children and Youth Services, second time. No, second time. You didn't hear me. I know the member wants me to do my job. The member from Eglinton Lawrence, come to order. Start the clock. Please. Charging people to see a doctor is wrong. Charging people to get a diagnosis is wrong. Charging people to renew a prescription is wrong. 
Minister Why of Municipal is the Minister Affairs, letting come to this order. happen? When is Question? he actually going to stop it? So, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this kind of accusation is so irresponsible and even dangerous, Mr. Speaker, these wild and vague accusations. And I would like to challenge the member opposite if she has specific examples which run contrary to the law in this province, the law in this country. I want her to bring them to me directly. I invite her to share them here and now with names, with specifics in this legislature, in the presence of the media, because you don't have those examples. You don't you. have those examples. Be seated. Be seated. New question, the member from Halliburton, Corfe Lake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. The demand for long-term care beds is becoming desperate in my riding. In fact, Central East Lynn continues to have the highest ratio of need to available beds in the entire province. There is now a wait list of over 1,700 people in need of long-term care beds in Halliburton, Corotha Lakes, Brock. That's double what it was a couple of years ago. And in Peterborough area, their number is now almost 2,900. The wait lists are so bad that a large group of concerned Ontarians drove down to Queen's Park this past winter to protest the government's inaction. So, Speaker, when will the minister finally act to address the crisis in long-term care? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we are acting. We recognize that there are parts of the province where we need to do more. We need to ensure that the capacity that exists reflects the needs of that local population. That's part of the reason why we're engaged right now in capacity planning across this province through the lens to look at a number of issues, in including the capacity in long-term care. But since we're the member referenced Central East, again, we've built more than 10,000 long-term care beds uh, since coming into office in 2003. Mr. Speaker, including many of them in Central East, 75 beds at Craigley Nursing Home, Member from Bruce Gray, 150 Ohio. new beds at Yeehong Centre, 100 new beds uh, at, in, at Scarborough Finch, Mr. Speaker, 128 at Helena Care for Seniors, uh, also in Central East. In Central East, uh, 160 further beds in Mong yes, Chong sir. Foundation. We know that there's more work to be done. We're redeveloping 30,000 beds. We're already in the process of completing 13,000 of those 30,000. Supplementary. Well, the fact is the 10,000 uh, beds number that the minister often likes to take credit for were, was actually the capacity started under the previous PC government. And so here we are, here we are 13 years later, 13 years of Liberal government, and there's no new capacity plan. We've been calling on the government for new long-term care beds for years, but the minister is just sitting on his hands. What's the point of having long-term care system that Ontarians can't even get into. They're dying on the wait list. So my question again is to the minister. When is he finally going to respond to the suffering families and address the out-of-control crisis in the long-term care beds? Yeah. In Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think we need to recognize that uh, what, what we're confronting here in Ontario is the same as what is being confronted across this country, across North America, and indeed in the world, an aging population, an aging population that in many respects is aging more healthily, Mr. Speaker, but also that they are having changing needs. And, and needs that we need to make sure that we are responding to. And that includes, for example, the investments that we're making in support for uh, individuals living with dementia. Uh, that also includes, of course, in recognizing that those in home care, in rather in long-term care homes, tend to be older now and they tend to have more complex conditions. So we've invested, we're investing about $50 million annually in behavioral supports for individuals in long-term care. We've, uh, we're dramatically increasing our investments Answer. in home and community care in the order of about 5 per cent per year. But we're focusing not only on new beds that we've created in long-term care and the redevelopment, but investments in the important resources that they need in those homes. Mr. New question, the member from Windsor, Tecumseh. Thank you, Speaker. I have a question. It's for the Deputy Premier. Good morning. I have a constituent. She's 67. Her husband is a stroke victim. She's trying to save money, Speaker. 
She got rid of her electric clothes dryer, switched to natural gas, and it only saved her 10 bucks a month. Her most recent hydro bill was for $130 of usage, but more than $100 in delivery charges. Speaker, what does the Deputy Premier say to folks struggling to keep up with her government's failed energy policies? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Well, uh, thank you, Speaker, and good morning to you too, sir. Um, th this example and many others that we have heard in this House for weeks now illustrate exactly why we are making the changes we are making, Speaker. It's part of the member from Stormont, come to order. Our values. People should not be struggling to pay their electricity bills when they have so many other demands, Speaker. So that is why we are bringing prices down by 25 percent on average, Speaker. There is additional support for people who live in rural Ontario and remote communities. There is additional support available for people who are in low-income households, Speaker. We've got additional supports available for people with medical needs uh, that require additional electricity usage, Speaker. So it is exactly Answer. that kind of story that has compelled us to make this significant reduction in electricity Thank you. prices. Supplementary. Speaker, my constituent takes a monthly prescription pill. It cost her more than $100. It's not covered by OHIP. There are times, she tells me, when she has to make a decision. Do I buy more medication or do I pay my hydro bill? She also tells me there are a lot of people, a lot of seniors in her neighborhood, and when she goes out in the evening and at night, those homes are darker these days, these nights, these evenings, because people can't afford to turn on their lights. She's not the only one struggling these days, Speaker. When can seniors in Ontario finally get a break from the failed policies of this Liberal government? Thank you. Thank you for your well, Speaker, the, the, the answer is they've already seen a reduction, Speaker, that uh, came in in the January bill. There will be additional savings if and when this legislation gets passed, Speaker. So what I would say to the member opposite, who I know actually cares about right. this issue and the people in this community, to support this bill. Their plan, Speaker, is a plan that would take $4 billion out of, of the services that people in this province rely on, like health care, Speaker. So the plan to spend $4 billion would not take one penny off one bill, Speaker. Our plan will do that. 25 percent on average and more for people facing particularly high electricity. Answer. Thank you. Your question, the member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Yesterday, Ontario made history by holding its first cap-and-trade auction. <laughs> Soon, 60 per cent of the world's economy will be covered by a carbon price, 90 per cent of which will be cap-and-trade systems. By entering into the carbon market, we're following through on our commitment to responsibly reduce emissions at the lowest possible cost. Our plan also calls for support for homeowners and businesses to benefit from home energy retrofits, public transit, and electric vehicle incentives. These are investments which, sadly, are non-existent in the schemes that we've seen from members of the opposition. Wow. Speaker, could the minister please speak to the benefits of Ontario's cap-and-trade program? Thank you. Minister of the Environment you, uh, Climate Change. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want, to th I want to thank, because we don't know the results, we don't for, well, for two weeks, but it was technically a huge success. I want to thank Ontarians, environmental groups, the nine largest emitting industry emitting associations from cement to auto who worked with us and have supported that and are participating in this and companies that are not passing costs on as the opposition would suggest but are result are reducing uh, st mary cement pond biofuels to reduce costs and emissions gold corp electrification of mining brookfield at ellis dawn net zero buildings massively reducing costs of buildings in ontario uh, exporters uh, reducing costs for small businesses and systemic programs general motors using biofuels and St. Catharines, UPS and FedEx reducing costs of delivery on Ontario with lower technologies. Uh, Nova Corporation doing massive cogen in Sarnia. All across our industrial and services, people are using carbon markets and cap and trade to reduce costs, renew our industrial Answer. infrastructure, and make Ontario more competitive. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. It's encouraging to hear that our government is taking an approach that's economically sound and transparent. What's not encouraging, however, are the comments that the PC leader has made on the eve of Ontario's first cap-and-trade auction. When referring to the Western Climate Initiative, the PC leader told the Toronto Star, and I quote, we would want to exit from this framework as quickly as possible. Speaker, politicizing an auction a day before it goes live is not just careless, but can potentially undermine the auction itself. When pressed by the CBC on his climate strategy, the PC leader was quoted as saying, and I quote, we're still going through our policy process on that. Mr. Speaker, given that our government does have a process in place, can the minister please explain to Answer the House uh, what it entails? Thank you, Minister. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I would agree with the observation by the minister that by by suggesting you're going to tear up the market and the WCI on the eve of the market was calculated to disrupt the market, Mr. Speaker. And, what, and that wasn't an attack on the government. That was an attack on the people. all of Ontario. Stop talking. I, I, I am listening very carefully, and the member is dangerously close to making an accusation to a member, and I would uh, caution him and ask that he no go further with that. Yeah. Thank you. Speaker, that challenges the market, which everyone is relying on. It's not the government of Ontario. It's Ontarians who are finding the most cost-effective ways to reduce emissions, businesses to compete, our, our petrochemical sectors, our trucking sectors who are out ahead of it, all who support it. They're asking me what would happen if the opposition tore this up and put a carbon tax in place that would start fuel prices at 16 cents higher at the pump, Mr. Speaker, and have no money Answer. to sustain these programs. Mr. That is all, Mr. Speaker. New question, the member from Sarnia Lambton. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. The member. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and to you and through you to the Acting Premier. Uh, Acting Premier, Sarnia Lambton constituent Carol Cote and a small group of friends have been gathering for years in a Sarnia church to uh, quilt. The group has a social conscience and soon began creating what they call comfort quilts for victims of disease, crime, or tragic incidents. The local church was kind enough to provide space in the gym one day a month for the group to meet. They only asked for whatever the donation the members of the group could give. Sadly, because of the unaffordable cost of hydro, the church has informed Carol that they will no longer be able to offer the gym without a rental charge, a charge the group unfortunately cannot afford. Deputy Premier, your energy crisis has now become a barrier to even charitable work in Ontario. Can you honestly say that you've done enough to correct the energy mistakes? What I, I can tell you is that we are the party that has a plan to bring down electricity prices, Speaker. Uh, it is a fair plan. It is, a, it is about helping everyone, Speaker. Everyone will benefit from this plan. It brings uh, the cost of electricity down by 25 per cent, and then we're, we're giving people the comfort of knowing that the rates will go up no higher than the rate of inflation for four years, Speaker. This uh, is a plan that uh, uh, we actually can stand behind. I'm still waiting to see what the PC plan is, but I don't think the people in Sarnia Lambton can wait till your your policy convention in November. They want action now, Speaker, and that's what we are doing. Sir, you supplementary. <laughs> Act, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, to you and through you to the acting premier. Unfortunately, your hydro hail mary comes too late for Carol and her group. Over the last five years, Carol and the Sarnia Sisterhood of Quilters have lovingly finished more than 200 quilts for various agencies in the community, hospitals, and individuals in need. They've never sought compensation or recognition. They only seek to make a positive remark mark on their community. Acting Premier, before your next million-dollar ad buy, patting yourself and party on the back, will you stop? and think of the welfare of groups like the Sarnia Sisterhood of Quilters rather than the welfare of the Ontario yeah, Liberal yeah, Party. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, we're hearing stories from real people, and I have no reason to, uh, to question that story, Speaker. The difference between them and us, though, is that we have a plan and we are delivering on that plan. 
The PCs are saying that they are going to rip up contracts, Speaker. Even they know that that will lead to the member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound, second time. That that will lead to increased costs. In fact, the PC energy critic said that renegotiation. The member from Niagara West, Glanbrook, come to order. Huge cost to taxpayers, and we're going to see continue, continue to see electricity prices rise. Speaker, they don't have a plan. They're not even able to criticize our plan. But, Speaker, we are moving forward. We are delivering results. We are reducing the price. Answer. Thank you. New question. The member from Tamiskimi, Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. LCBO employees are professionals who perform an important public service regulating the sale and consumption of alcohol related products in the province. And they're doing a very good job because. Even on the profit side, they've shown growth in 21 straight, straight years. Last year, 215, 216, two billion dollars in profit. Profit that, because it belongs to us, goes to schools, to health care, to home care. But those profits would also be very attractive to the private sector, for good reason. My question is, and I have a question, will the Premier will the Premier commit to not sell off the LCBO? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Minister of Finance. Sir Finance. Mr. Speaker, let me be really clear here. Notwithstanding what Smokey Thomas has requested, which is to buy the LCBO and privatize it for their own benefit. It is not for sale, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Once again, to the acting premier. LCBO stores are clean, safe, highly regulated places to purchase alcoholic beverages. Come to order. Please finish. They're a clear gem among this province's crown assets. And despite the Minister of Finance's attempt to, to deflate or what's the deflate. Premier's word? Conflate the issue? <laughs> Hydro One wasn't for sale either. The Premier said it wasn't for sale, and then magically it was. The question is, is the same thing going to happen to LCBO? <laughs> Seated, please. Thank you, Minister. You uh, Mr. Speaker, well, we still own Hydro One and will always be the largest shareholder, and we'll reinvest all for dollar into our economy to continue to build new assets. And the member opposite has made an important point: the LCBO is a highly attractive organization, its value is strong, its contribution to the province is strong, and that in itself is what is, is that it, for itself is why we are not even considering uh, mobilizing anything for the LCBO except expanding its reach to ensure that it continues to contribute for the benefit of Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, that is exactly what we're doing. And when it came to Hydro One and other assets, we made the same assessment and realized we could do better. And we are doing better on all cases. LCBO is not for sale. Thank you. New question. Thank you. New question, the member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of International Trade. In trade and in governance as a whole, taking a proactive approach to the issues that matter most to constituents and businesses is of the utmost importance to us That's right. and is a defining characteristic of our government. This approach was exemplified earlier this week when Minister Chan and Minister Duguid travelled to Albany, New York to join That's Monique right. Smith, Ontario's trade representative in Washington, 
and her Quebec counterpart to meet with New York state legislators to represent Ontario's business interests. In light of the shifting trade climate, I know that the businesses in my community value the proactive efforts made by our government to boldly protect their opportunities for growth. Can the minister share with this legislature the Question. importance of a strong New York State trade relationship on both sides Thank of you. the border? Good question. Uh, minister for International Trade. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, for the question, and I want to thank the member, um, Barry, for asking. Speaker, as part of our government's many engagement efforts with the U.S., Minister Dugan and I traveled to Albany, New York, on Tuesday and engaged in seven meetings with New York state legislators. We advocate on behalf of Ontarians seeking an exemption from proposed by American provisions that could potentially affect access to procurement contracts. Speaker, during these discussions, we stress the fact that both Ontario and New York State grow together as our economies are deeply integrated. Speaker, in fact, Ontario is the destination for 80 per cent of all goods exported from New York to Canada. Answer. Speaker, trade matters to Ontario, and a strong and balanced relationship with our U.S. partners serve to benefit workers and businesses on both sides of the border. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Minister of International Trade for his efforts and his response. Right. Minister, New York State's Buy American policy is part of their budget bill that will be passed at the end of this month. This policy will prevent non-American companies from bidding on New York State government procurement. Not this good. kind of protectionist policy is rightfully of concern to Ontario businesses. We understand that your trip surrounded efforts to ask New York State legislatures uh, to exempt Canada from this policy. My question is to, to the minister is, how did the meetings go and what happens next? Wow. Thank you, Minister. Speaker to Ministry of Economic Development and Growth. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to begin by thanking my colleague, the Minister of International Trade and the Minister of Economic Development for Quebec, uh, Dom Dominic, uh, Dominique uh, Anglade, uh, for traveling with us and working with us in, in our efforts in Albany uh, this week. As New York State is our number one international comp uh, customer, uh, Mr. Speaker, and we are their number one international customer, I, I want to say that the minister and I are very proud to stand up for our business community here in Ontario and strongly make the case that Canadian businesses uh, need to be exempt from the Buy American policy, or, Mr. Speaker, it could very well cost, indeed, New York State jobs as well. So it's very important that they get that message. I'm pleased to report to all members of the legislature that our message Answer. was very well received. In fact, I was pleasantly surprised by the knowledge of that by the folks that we met with. And, Mr. Speaker, I uh, will continue to pursue this. Thank you. New question, a member from Wellington, Houghton Hills. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. The Attorney General is well aware that Halton Region is in urgent need of a new courthouse. The existing courthouse in Milton is aging, overcrowded, and inadequate to deal with the needs of a rapidly growing Halton Region. Working with local stakeholders, we have been advocating for a new courthouse for more than two years now. As one of the Halton area MPPs, I have raised this issue in the legislature many times. My question is very simple. Why is it taking the Attorney General so long to announce approval of the new Halton Courthouse we so desperately need? Thank you. Attorney General. Thank you very much, Speaker. Another I want to thank the question. member opposite for a very important question. And indeed, uh, Halton, uh, a new courthouse in Halton is a, is a top priority uh, for, uh, for my ministry. Speaker, I want to give a, uh, a big uh, uh, thank you to the members from Oakville, Burlington and, and Halton for their ongoing advocacy on behalf of the of the community, working along with the member from Halton Hills and uh, in making sure that we have a uh, new courthouse in, in Halton. Uh, speaker, uh, I've had the opportunity Suspend to uh, make 
uh, to meet with the local community as well, with the local uh, uh, local uh, government um, as well, to understand the need of Halton, uh, along with uh, the members from uh, Oakville, Burlington, and Halton, and the member from Halton Hill, to make sure that we have uh, we have all the the processes in, in place. And speaker, uh, in in supplement, uh, I will speak to exactly what steps we have taken so that we have a new courthouse in Halton. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, we have been assured repeatedly by both this Attorney General and his predecessor that a new Halton Courthouse is his ministry's top priority. However, despite these assurances, we're still waiting. And while we're waiting, access to justice in Halton Region is compromised. According to the Halton County Law Society, litigants are often required to travel to Brampton or Guelph because the current courthouse simply can't handle the volume of cases. In fact, there have been examples where criminal cases have been thrown out because it was taking too long to get them to trial. Surely the Attorney General would agree this is unacceptable. Will he commit to this House that a new Halton Courthouse will be approved and announced this year? Yeah. Thank you. Speaker, uh, as I said earlier, a, a new courthouse for the Halton region is on the top uh, of the Ministry's priority project list. Again, I want to uh, uh, acknowledge all the work uh, that member, uh, members from uh, Oakville Burlington and Halton has done on this very important issue. Speaker, as a result of that work, uh, we have created a design expert, appointed yep. design expert who's been hired to develop the design requirements for a new courthouse and has met with Infrastructure Ontario as part of the design process. Wow. There also, Speaker, has been meetings between the design expert and the users of the court and the local community to better understand uh, their needs. Those consultations, Speaker, began in August, have put the ministry in a good position to move forward with the project implementation of the Halton Region Consolidated Courthouse. We recognize, Speaker, that there is a clear need to address facility challenges in, in Halton Region, and I uh, assure Answer. the member opposite, and I've, as I've assured the members from, from Oakville, Halton, and Burlington, that Here. this is our top priority, and we will get it done. Thank you. New question, the member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. More than a year ago, London Health Sciences Centre, CMHA Middlesex and Middlesex London EMS came up with an innovative project to divert 3,000 mental health patients each year from the emergency room to the CMHA Crisis Centre. The project has stalled because provincial legislation only allows ambulance transfer of patients directly to a public hospital and not to a community-based crisis centre. LHSC, CMAJ and EMS have been asking for months for the Minister of Health to approve the project as a pilot to allow it to go ahead. The Minister told the media yesterday that the project is already underway, but in fact it is waiting on his desk for sign-off. Will the Minister commit to signing off today so that the project can proceed Mr. immediately? Thank you. Minister of Health, long-term care. So, uh... Mr. Speaker, I, I did have the opportunity to speak to this, uh, I believe it was yesterday, uh, and the work that, that CMHA, a Canadian Mental Health Association, is doing in London with the brand new uh, crisis centre that we funded uh, to the tune of $1.2 million. Uh, it's remarkably important because it provides uh, sick, uh, uh, crisis intervention for adults, youth and adults aged eight, age 16 and, and up uh, in both London and Middlesex County. Uh, they uh, have put forward a proposal that we're looking at uh, which would permit uh, uh, emergency medical services to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, thank you, to transport uh, patients in crisis directly to that crisis center. Uh, the member herself has acknowledged that it would require, it is currently illegal to do that, it would require yes, a legislative change to the Ambulance Act. It obviously would have implications province-wide, but it is something that we're looking at. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the mental health crisis in my community keeps getting worse. On Monday this week, LHSC psychi Psychiatric ER was at 152 percent capacity wow. with 26 mental health patients wow. waiting for beds. Oh, wow. This ER diversion project could save about $2.5 million annually by reducing the need for ambulances to transfer patients to the ER first and then wait, sometimes for hours, before they can transfer patients to the crisis centre. After he signs off on the pilot, hopefully today, will the minister commit to reinvesting the $2.5 million in savings back into the community?
city so that the crisis centre has enough nurses to care for the expected 3,000 patients and LHSC can start putting patients in beds instead of hallway stretchers. Yeah. Thank you. Minister. Well, you know, Mr. Speaker, I wish it was that easy. First of all, if I was to approve the pilot that the member opposite is advocating for, and I have to say that the member from London North Centre has been a strong advocate for this, and we have had conversations about it. But we can, I can no, no more sign off on a pilot, which is nowhere near my desk, by the way. I can't sign off on that because it would be breaking the law. No, no, no. That's. I'm asking for quiet. Carry on. But this is a very important project, and it points to the success of. Mr. Speaker, this is a very important project, and it points to the success of the crisis centre that we, this government, funded, those beds that are available, the supports that are available in the community. I'm taking this very, very seriously. There is a lot of support for this, Answer. including the member to the left of me. And, Mr. Speaker, the ministry is looking at this, but it does have bigger implications in terms of it is currently Thank illegal. You. It would require legislative changes to the ambulance. New question. It, the member from uh, Brampton Springdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. The number of First Nations communities in Ontario without access to safe drinking water is unacceptable. As the Premier stated yesterday during question period, this matter is of high priority to our government. I know that the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, as well as the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, are both working hard to address this issue. Can the Minister please elaborate on what our government is doing to ensure that our First Nations communities have access to safe and clean drinking water. Thank you, Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, we are committed to a trilateral process with Canada on a five-year plan to provide First Nation reserves with access to safe drinking water and to develop a longer-term strategy to ensure that solutions are implemented and long-lasting. Ontario is pleased with Ottawa's $2 billion investment in water treatment plants on reserves across Canada. Since 2015, Ontario has spent or committed a total of $23.74 million in provincial money to on-reserve drinking water projects in Ontario. But more work needs to be done. This trilateral process with Canada and First Nations will continue to identify options to expedite and ensure that safe water drinking priority, safe water yes, drinking is a priority. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's assuring to hear that our government is working hard in placing a high priority on this matter. All Ontarians must have access to safe water, especially partners in our Indigenous communities. Although there is much work left to do, I am encouraged to know that this government is taking the necessary steps to solve this issue. I know that this is also an important matter for the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, and that this is, and they are also involved in the trilateral process. Mr. Speaker, can the, uh, can the minister please elaborate on the specifics of what the Ministry of Climate Change is doing and uh, what they've done and what they are currently doing? Minister. Speaker, I refer this uh, supplementary to the very effective Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Justice title, please. Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The role of our ministry in working with Minister Zimmer's ministry uh, and the federal government of First Nations is important. What we're involved in, Mr. Speaker, is getting the planning and the assessments ready to support the capital infrastructure being undertaken by the federal government, uh, reaffirmed in its budget, Mr. Speaker. We are carrying out water sampling in eight communities. We are doing the profiling of water and microbiology and chemistry in 14 more within the next two months, Mr. Speaker. We are doing the on site assessments and visits to provide recommendations for seven communities so they can establish their water treatment facilities. We are providing expertise and support to 10 councils and First Nations organizations to help them accelerate the movement of water projects forward. And we are providing comprehensive training across Ontario's First Nations for uh, facility operators to operate the, the plants once they are repaired and new ones are established. Yes, this, this is a powerful and transformative partnership 
with First Nations and the federal government, Mr. Speaker, finally getting clean water Thank to you. communities who have been waiting too long for it. New question? The member from Scarborough Rouge River. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Mayor John Tory wrote what I've been saying for a long time, and he said, quotation on, I've talked to hundreds of people about Scarborough Subway Extension, but I've also listened to those people, and I've heard the message loud and clear from Scarborough residents. Scarborough needs better transit. Mr. Speaker, they need a better transit now. Mr. Speaker, when will this government get a shovel in the ground and start building the Scarborough subway? You say it, please. You say it, please. Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I, th I thank the member uh, opposite from his, uh, for his question. I I, uh, I believe that everybody in this chamber knows uh, that this Premier, our Premier, and our government, including our members from Scarborough, of which we have almost every, uh, every ride and covered in this, uh, in this caucus, uh, Speaker, uh, were first at the table with respect to providing uh, $1.48 billion to wow. help support a transit expansion for the subway expansion uh, in Scarborough. Speaker, we continue to work very closely with the City of Toronto, with Mayor Tory, with our federal partners as well. Uh, to make sure that we continue to expand transit, that we build the subway extension in Scarborough, and that we continue to build transit in every corner of Toronto and right across the GTHA, and frankly, in communities like Waterloo and Ottawa and so many other speakers. I look forward to the follow-up question from the member opposite. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, again. Mayor Tory talked about his time at the Scarborough Town Centre at the station, and I was with him at that time, and said he, Talk to people as they made the mad morning rush to transfer from a bus to RT just so that they could transfer to again to the subway station. I'm subway at the Canada station. Order, please. The vast majority of those riders were ready for some transit relief now. Mr. Speaker, Scarborough is ready for transit relief now. What will the construction, when will the construction begin? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. you know, Speaker, I try to be nice in this House from time to time when members are asking uh, questions that, uh, that actually make a lot of sense. Speaker, I don't, I don't really understand that member's perspective. He is a former City of Toronto councillor. He would, of course, know that the City of Toronto is leading on this particular project. He understands it's a project the City of Toronto is not only leading on, the TTC would build. Speaker, I think if anybody reasonably checks the historical record, they would understand that that particular member throughout his long political career has had a multitude of positions on this particular item, Speaker. There's only one party here on this side of the House that's being consistent on this. We are going to build the Scarborough subway extension, Speaker, because of members on our side of the House who represent Scarborough and do it proudly, and because our Premier is the only political leader in Ontario committed to building our province up. Thanks very much, Speaker. Can you see it, please? Can you see it, please? Thank you. New question. The member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. We know that our public libraries provide extraordinary value to their communities, whether it's employment skills upgrading or the integration of new Ontarians, or whether it's providing free space for seniors groups or the early development of literacy skills. Our public libraries create community across this province. However, in Waterloo, our public library hydro bills have been rising with no end in sight. In fact, I've heard firsthand over the last three years, the increase in their hydro bills have been staggering. In 2014, 15 Waterloo Public Library's electricity costs rose by 18 per cent. Uh, the following year, by 26 per cent. Public libraries' operating budgets are being squeezed, and public service is being sacrificed. My question is simple to the Acting Premier. Can you tell Ontarians why she's allowed energy costs to impact public libraries in the province of Ontario? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Well, 
Thank you, Speaker. And, and again, um, we hear a story about the impact of high electricity rates, Speaker. We understand those stories. We hear them ourselves in our own communities. And that is why we are taking action to significantly reduce the uh, electricity bills for organizations, for, for individuals, and for, uh, for businesses. And, and uh, libraries would be included in that, Speaker. So my question back to the uh, member is, you don't have a plan that will take a penny off a bill. Your plan is to actually spend $4 billion more for something that will not take one penny off one bill, including the bill of that library. So, Speaker, we have a plan. We're moving forward. We would welcome the support of the members opposite for our plan. Yes, sir, thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, with all due respect, we haven't seen your plan. You have not tabled this legislation in this House. Problem, it's that side of the house on this file, Mr. Speaker. So, Premier, our, uh, back to the acting Premier. Our public library budgets are being compromised because of your out of control hydro rates. Your government's public library operating grants fund less than 5% of library operating budgets. In Toronto, utility, uh, library utility, utility, utility bills increased by almost $700,000 between 2014 and 2015, and they're projecting a significant increase this year. Rising electricity bills and chronic underfunding have created a crisis for libraries. Out of desperation, Toronto Public Libraries are now opening without staff. Oh. Imagine libraries Question. without librarians. Wow. Acting Premier, why is your government forcing libraries to choose between paying their bills or staffing their libraries? Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. To stand in this House Speaker and talk proudly about our support for public libraries. And I know the member opposite will join me in not only celebrating that support, Mr. Speaker, but supporting it when it comes up forward as we table our budget, Speaker, and on our ongoing conversation. So I know that I can count on your support for our public libraries. Here's just a sample of what we've done since 2003, Speaker. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, come to order, please. And the member from Hamilton Mountain, come to order, please. Finish, please. Thank you, Speaker. In the uh, spirit of quiet uh, conversations in libraries, Speaker, perhaps we can continue <laughs> in that vein to talk precisely about what we've done for public libraries. Happy to start that since 2003, Speaker, over half a billion dollars this government has invested in our public and our First Nations libraries. $33.5 million last year alone, Speaker. That support's going to continue, and we're proud of it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Ontario's agri-food sector supports close to 800,000 jobs and contributes more than $36.4 billion towards the province's GDP. The agri-food sector is one of the biggest employers in my riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore and also includes the Ontario Food Terminal, all of which is powered by Ontario's farmers. This past week, the Canadian Agricultural, Society, uh, Agricultural Safety Week took place with the goal of raising awareness of farm safety across Canada, and our government commends their efforts here in Ontario and across the country. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please provide this House with more information on how the Canadian Agricultural Question. Safety Week is working to improve safety in farms across Canada each year? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Welfare. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore for his question this morning. And I know during his work as MPP for that riding, he goes door to door to promote backyard gardens in his riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore. But, Mr. Speaker, Canadian Agriculture Safety Week happens every year with the goal of raising awareness for farm safety in Canada, and our government commends their efforts here in Ontario and across the country. I'm proud to stand with the Canadian Agriculture Safety Association and the Canadian Federation of Agriculture recognizing the importance of farm safety. Their three-year farm safety campaign, being AgriSafe Family, has been crucial in providing resources and raising the profile of farm safety across Canada. Last year, the campaign's focus for Canadian Agriculture Safety Week was on children 
This year, the focus is on, on adult farm safety, and in 2018, the focus will be promoting farm safety for seniors. Answer. Mr. Speaker, I want to conclude. I even made a wonderful short video highlighting the importance of Agriculture Safety Thank Week. You. I posted on my video. No, you, you will conclude. The uh, member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke on a point of order. I apologize for not doing this earlier, but I did want to welcome to Queen's Park today uh, OPSU uh, member Brian Hickman, who is a liquor store employee in Eganville in my riding of Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke. Thank you for doing this. Member from Nickel Belt. From Nickel Belt on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, through my question, the Minister of Health had asked uh, for information onto the two tier system, and he's asked that I send it over. So not a point of order. You can do that on your own. Point of order. If I may, I just want to very quickly uh, acknowledge that um, ministry officials from the Ministry of Education who have worked on Bill 92 are here in the gallery and watching, and I just want to thank them for their work. We have a deferred vote on the motion, a third reading of Bill 92, an act to amend the School Board's Collective Bargaining Act 2014 and make related amendments and other statutes. Calling the members, this will be a five minute bell.
All members, please take their seats. <laughs> Threw them under the bus. I like that. All members, please take their seats. We have a deferred vote on the motion to third reading. On March 22, 2017, Ms. Hunter moved that third reading of the Bill 92, an act to amend school boards collective bargaining act 2014 to make related amendments to other statutes. All those in favor, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Nack. Mr. Nack. Mr. Brad. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Sandal. Ms. Sandal. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Co Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Mr. Domerlin. Mr. Domerlin. Mr. McGarry. Mr. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Jassy. Mr. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mrs. Wong. Mrs. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Vernil. Ms. Vernil. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. All those opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Chubisson. Ms. Chubisson. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Ms. DeNovo. Ms. DeNovo. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Gelina. Madame Gelina. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The eyes are 75, the nays are 14. The eyes being 75, the nays being 14, I declare the motion carried. The bill, be it resolved that the bill be now passed and be entitled as in the motion. We have a deferred vote on Government Orders No. 4, 5, 6, uh, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Call in the members. This will be a five minute bell. March 22, 2017, Ms. Sandals moved concurrence and supply for Minister of Finance. All those in favor, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Nack. Mr. Nack. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. 
Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Ms. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mrs. Wong. Mrs. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Renio. Ms. Renio. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. All those opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McDonald. Mr. McDonald. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Van, Mr. Van Tom. Mr. Van Tom. Ms. DeNovo. Ms. DeNovo. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Satler. Ms. Satler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Gelinot. Madame Gelinot. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 53, the nays are 38. The ayes being 53 and the nays being 38, I declare the motion carried. We have a deferred vote on the government order number five on March 22nd. Do I have to finish reading it? I have to finish reading it, sorry. Guys. Move the concurrence and supply for the Minister of Transportation, including supplementaries. All those in favour of motion, please rise one at a time and be recognized Same by the vote. Same vote. Same vote. The ayes are 53, the nays are 38. <laughs> the ayes being 30, uh, 53 and the nays being 38, I declare the motion carried. We have a deferred vote on the, mo uh, the government order number seven on March 22, 2017. Ms. Sandals moved concurrence and supply of the Ministry of Aboriginal Affairs, including supplementaries. Same vote. Same vote. Same vote. Same vote. The ayes are 53, the nays are 38. The uh, <coughs> ayes being 53, the nays being 38. I declare the motion carried. We have a deferred vote on the government order number eight on March 22. Uh, Ms. Sandals moved. Uh, concurrence and supply for Minister of Energy, including supplementaries. Uh, do we have same vote? Same vote. Same vote. The ayes are 53. The nays are 38. The ayes being <coughs> the ayes being 53 and the nays being 38. To declare the motion carried. We have deferred vote on Government Order 9. Ms. Sandals moved concurrence and supply for the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Same vote. Same vote. Same vote. The ayes are 53. The nays are 38. The ayes being 53 and the nays being 38, I declare the motion carried. Deferred vote on Government Order 10. Ms. Sandals moves concurrence on supply for Ministry of Education on March 22nd. Same vote. Same vote. I'm sorry? Same vote, oh, okay, sorry, including supplementaries. Uh, same, vote. same vote. The ayes are 53, the nays are 38. Have to do it right. The ayes being 53 and the nays being 38, I declare the motion carried. We have a deferred vote on the government order number 11. On March 22, 2017, Ms. Sandals moved concurrence and supply for the Ministry of Children and Youth Services. Same vote. Same vote. Same vote. Same vote. The ayes are 53, the nays are 38. The ayes being 53 and the nays being 38, I declare the motion carried. With deferred vote on Government Order 12. On March 22, 2017, Ms. Sandals moved concurrence and supply for the Office of Francophone Affairs. Same vote? Same vote. Same vote. The ayes are 53, the nays are 38. Ayes being 53 and the nays being 38, declare the motion carried. 
We have a deferred vote on the motion of closure or motion of the second reading of Bill 68. Let me read that again. Let me read that again. We have a deferred vote on the motion for closure on the motion for second reading of Bill 68. Same vote? No. I heard a no. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill. On November 29, 2016, Ms. Mr. Morrow moved second reading of Bill 68, an act to amend various acts in relation to municipalities. Mr. Coteau has moved that the question be now put. All those in favour of Mr. Coteau's motion, people to rise one at a time, be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandal. Mr. Sandal. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. No. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Barnetti. Mr. Barnetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangas. Mrs. Mangas. Mr. Craft. Mr. Craft. Ms. Domerlo. Ms. Domerlo. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Hunter. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. McMahon. Mr. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Hunter. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Renil. Ms. Renil. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. All those opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McDonald. Mr. McDonald. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Yurk. Mr. Yurk. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Ostrow. Mr. Ostrow. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonald. Mr. McDonald. Mr. Pettipees. Mr. Pettipees. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Denovo. Mr. Denovo. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sadler. Ms. Sadler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Angelina. Ms. Angelina. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Yamanta. Ms. Yamanta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 53, the nays are 38. The ayes being 30, 53 and the nays being 38, I declare the motion carried. Mr. Monroe, uh, Mr. Morrow has moved second reading of Bill 68, an act amended various acts in relation to municipalities. It's the pleasure of the House, the motion carried. Carry. I heard a no. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Aye. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute vote.
Mr. Morrow has moved second reading of Bill 68, an act of various acts in relation to municipalities. All those in favour of the motion, please rise one at a time. You're recognized by the clerk. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Nack. Mr. Nack. Mr. Brad. Mr. Brad. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Mrs. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardnetti. Mr. Bardnetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangas. Mrs. Mangas. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Mrs. Domerlin. Mrs. Domerlin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. Jassen. Mrs. Jassen. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mrs. Wong. Mrs. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Mr. Hogarth. Mr. Hogarth. Mr. Koala. Mr. Koala. Mr. Molly. Mr. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Ms. Denovo. Ms. Denovo. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Monroe. Mr. Monroe. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Ostrov. Mr. Ostrov. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. The ayes are 67, the nays are 24. The ayes being 67 and the nays being 24, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, Deuxième de Loi. Shall the bill be ordered for third reading? Minister? Yes, that the bill be referred to the Standing Committee on Social Policy. Oh, I was thinking about. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.